Let's do this. Well, lads, we are done with yet another shit show of a drag race season. Oh my god, but why do you watch the show if you don't like it? Babes, there's a difference between disliking something and pointing out the negatives in something that you like, in hopes of it being better. I need to have this here in the beginning, because a lot of subjects will be covered. Many fans that are actual children who do nothing but rabidly annoy people online will probably be offended for no reason, and this may be a lot. For that reason, I'll divide this video in a couple of parts, so that if you wanted to hear my opinion on a certain aspect of the season, you can just skip to that. The timestamps will be in the pinned comment. I find it a little forced to just list pros and cons of the season, this way it feels a little bit more organic. So, set your thermostat to a sensible 23 degrees Celsius, because we're not crackheads, we don't use Fahrenheit in this house, and let's get into it. All-Stars 5 changed up the rules of the main All-Stars format, introduced on All-Stars 2, where the top two queens of the week lip-sync for their legacies, not just to win the episode and $10,000, but also to eliminate one of the queens Rue and the producers put up for elimination. This time, they kept a part of that, borrowing from Survivor's main format of the entire cast voting somebody out. However, and, as you're well aware, if the winner of the week is able to beat an alleged lip-sync assassin, only their vote counts. Now, I've already done a video on these lip-sync assassins, how it's not an exact science to determine them, but also just why this is a faulty concept. And one of you sent me this on Instagram, showing that with every single lip-sync this season, the winner of the week voted with the majority, so there was absolutely never any suspense in hindsight of who was going home. There was also never any suspense of who was going home while watching the show, partially due to no long-term storytelling and editing seemingly planned, but also because pretty much every week the weakest contestant went home, so the survivor format of the entire cast voting proved to be very underwhelming on Drag Race. However, this is not on the queens, the actual cast, but rather the producers themselves. Survivor players are almost exclusively people that are appearing on TV for the first and last time in their lives. They are people whose jobs usually don't have much to do with arts or anything in the public eye. They may gain some social following and curate an influencer-esque career, and some of them do reach a certain level of being famous, but almost as a rule of thumb, the only fan response they get has to do with the season that they played. With Drag Race and its contestants, that is not the case. On one hand, the queens will have to work with each other after the season, so they can't ruffle the feathers too much. On the other, more serious hand, if there can even be such of a hand, the fan response at the queens, if they are anything but confident and congenial, will be unbearable. Also, the twist of everyone's in the bottom but the winner during the second half into the season is completely stupid. It just adds unnecessary drama, and when it was implemented, it clearly was put into power to hinder the statistically strongest competitor up to that point, so that the person who the show wanted to win actually got a leg up on her. That actually never happened, except for the finale when she won. This twist ultimately backfired on them, giving us the first ever winner that was up for elimination three times, out of which that placement was legitimate once or twice. Going back to the previous point, the queens, instead of voting out the most obvious winner the first moment they had a chance, didn't do that, probably because they wanted to play it fair, and really make it a made the best woman win type of a thing. But I can bet you my right nut that at least some of them did not vote for the said queen because they knew the fans would eat them up which is exactly what happened. It's no surprise to anyone that certain fans of Drag Race, meaning the ones that feel the need to add the queens whenever they share their opinion on them, are absolute crackheads. Before the season even began airing, they came for Mayhem Miller for wearing a bodysuit easily bought on Amazon for quite literally no reason whatsoever. Now, 
I'm not going to sit here and say that you cannot share your opinion on things that you yourself do not indulge in, because that's an absolutely ridiculous sentiment, but I will, however, say that calling out people on the price of their outfits and where they bought them is not a nice thing to do, nor is it even constructive criticism. It's borderline classist. Next on the fans are crackheads menu are people that attacked Cracker after episode 1 for seemingly no reason. Now, this brings me to an even more important issue of Drag Race fans being racist. So, Cracker in episode 2 very upfront told Onjina that she wished she could have voted her out of the show because Onjina just didn't have the confidence to be there. Next, when Alexis Mateo called her out on playing the game and being very selective with whom she surrounds herself with, Cracker played the victim. You know what the majority of the fandom did with this blatant villainous behavior? They defended Cracker. Aww. By the way, I'm saying villainous behavior because I'm reviewing a reality TV show and I don't know Cracker personally, but as I explained in my Who Should Win Some Stars 5 video, she very obviously came with a tactic that at first she hid was a tactic, but in the last episode flat out said was there. Now. Back to the fans defending Cracker. Before sharing my two cents, I wanted to read a post that I got from Twitter, which is from Reddit, about this. So it reads, I've seen so many fans say they get where Cracker is coming from, cause they see themselves in her. Too bad they couldn't see themselves in Raja's frustration and insecurity over being dismissed, Latrice's confidence in her legacy, Kennedy's pain over being dismissed by fans and bookers, the Vixen's anger at injustice, Nina Bonina's paranoia and depression, and so on. But hey, between Gigi and Cracker, they've decided enough is enough, and fans should no longer react to any villain edits. So inspiring to see them feel motivated to take that stand now, for these specific cases. In short, I agree mostly with this. The only part I disagree with is the fact that the user classified Cracker's behavior as a villain edit. It's not an edit if she, not prompted by the producers, says what she said and does what she did. The rest of the queens mentioned sure as hell did get villain edits, ironically, sometimes when the sentiment that they shared were sentiments of the majority of the audience, especially in the Vixens and Raja's cases. When Asia O'Hara on season 10 said that Cracker should go home during the top 5 episode because she did not see a star in her, people were up in arms about it. But when Cracker in the workroom attacks, yes, attacks on Gina, completely unprompted by the producers or the judges, it's a-okay and you understand it. Please explain that to me. The only queen that got a villain edit throughout All Stars 5 was Alexis Mateo, but I will talk about how ridiculous that was when we discuss each queen later. Alexis got a lot of hate from the fans, a lot of it being, I wouldn't say racially charged, but definitely culturally charged, which he expressed in a Twitter video saying how much harder it is for Hispanic queens on Drag Race. And lastly, on the subject of the fans, a lot of people, like just in my comments, a lot of people said that she was going to win because of the current situation in the United States and the Black Lives Matter movement. Which is just... It all boils down to a portion of the audience being racist. There is a video on Honey Davenport's Instagram, it's less than 5 minutes long, showing the racism in the fandom that still exists and I recommend you watch it. On a similar note, we also need to talk about a different batch of fans that think that any negative criticism towards any specific black queen or just you not rooting for a specific queen that just happens to be black is racist. No babes, that's not it. From what I've seen, most of these fans, or rather stands, are young people still unaware of how their behavior has consequences in real life. Before the finale, I tweeted this. After seeing a plethora of tweets spamming people because they were either Team Jujubee or Team Cracker, to which I got these kinds of responses. Mind you, this type of behavior is not as bad as being racist, but it's very annoying. To the point where, after I asked exactly when I have ever said something racist, one of these people just said, IDK. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, the fans are toxic on most ends, a portion of the fandom needs to stop with the racist treatment of any queen, and as a whole, they have made the show far worse.
While on surface the cast is very interesting, Jujubee's episode 1 read of this season being a some star season proved itself very quickly as true. Let's go over each queen now in order of elimination. So first, Derek Barry. Derek was one of the highlights of the season. She gave us a great television and helped us see the obvious nonsensical meddling from the producers from the get-go. I won't talk about the editing here in this section, but I just want to mention that you could tell from the first quarter of episode 1 that they were building up the story of Derek being eliminated and India doing well in the episode. We later found out that Derek's best bits from her performance in episode 1 were cut, those being her Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton impersonations. Oh, and we'll talk about the ridiculousness of that first challenge and why they need to retire it, or at least look up the definition of the word talent before All Star 6. And then there was also this idea that Derek should not have done Britney. Um, that's, uh, how do you say this in English? Uh, stupid. That's her bread and butter. That's why she was cast on season 8 in the first place. It's insane to me that RuPaul and the judges are against most of the queens that impersonate specific female celebrities and that type of drag, but they based Snatch Game, their most popular challenge, almost exclusively around that concept, as well as the Divas Live challenge, the Madonna Runway, and so on. Derek herself even said that she wanted to come in as Britney, because that's what she's known for, show other impersonations that she could do, not just keep it safe and perform well as Britney or just herself, and then afterwards she would not have done Britney at all. In short, Derek was never winning this season, but she would have made it much more enjoyable had she stayed at least an episode longer. Angina's time on All Stars 5 was simply tragic. Not in a Stan Twitter lingo meaning of the word, but it just was sad to watch. You had this incredibly strong, groundbreaking competitor, a pioneer of the show that competed in season 1 and could have won the season had the show not tried to play it safe back then, who was almost cast on every single season of All Stars and was finally cast on All Stars 5 and she ended up asking the queens to vote for her because she was defeated right after flopping in the reading challenge, which was even more disappointing to watch because her reads and jokes in season 1 were stellar. We had great expectations for Angina, but sadly those expectations weighed her down and ruined her chances. Mariah Paris Balenciaga much like Derek, was never winning this season. And her inclusion did confuse me, but at the end of the day, I could understand it. Sadly, Mariah suffers from being one of the more quiet queens, so her three-episode stint did not leave much impression on me. Again, we'll talk about that first challenge. Then Mayhem. Similarly to Angina, we had great expectations for Mayhem, not just on this season, but season 10 as well, and much like on season 10, she was kinda underwhelming. Mayhem, much like Angina, pulled a self-elimination, which she explained why she did in the finale of the season, and yeah, I can respect her move. What I can also respect is her being the first queen of the season to try and be strategic by forming a pact with India that did work in her favor, but not in the long run. So so, again, a little underwhelming, but not completely forgettable showing for Mayhem. India Fera. I don't think I'm alone when I say that I did not enjoy India on this season. From her playing the victim with Derek, even though we found out later that it was India who started the whole thing between them, to her lying and trying to pull down Alexis and Mayhem in a desperate attempt to stay in the competition while being the worst contestant, she just did not come off as a good, genuine person. Again, I don't know her in real life, I'm just commenting on what was presented to me on a reality TV show that she was on, but based on similar sentiments from some of her colleagues, it's not that far from the truth. Alexis Mateo's inclusion into this season was genius. Well, the inclusion of all of the early season queens was genius. You can really tell how differently Alexis, Juju, India, Mariah, and Angina played the game, really just presenting themselves the way they were, as opposed to these newer queens that clearly heavily thought about creating narratives for themselves and were too calculated. Except for Derek. 
Derek was just off the rails the entire time. Alexis, as a person, was very refreshing to see on Drag Race. She was somebody who was not fake, somebody who was honest, and somebody who did not want to be pulled into petty drama. Her drag was also very refreshing to see, given that she makes almost everything that she wears, and it almost always looks exquisite and interesting. On an All-Stars with a different format, she would have killed it. I can already hear her stance disliking this video. But I don't care. Blair was the milk of All Stars 5. She never showed anything spectacular. If ever praised by the judges, it was something we had already seen before, and she thought that the rest of the cast always saw her as competition, even in her last episode when she never won a challenge and did the worst out of all of them. She's probably a Shea stan, you know, track records only matter when they go in your favor, and certain episodes when she clearly does badly also magically don't count now. To quote any YouTube comment by somebody who doesn't know how to give arguments to their opinions, delusion. Convince yourself. I've mentioned already a little why I loved Jujube on this season, but I need to broaden this. She came in there and talked about her cat. <laughs> she did not care about giving the producers the drama and the dramatic monologues in the confessionals. She came there with a new lease on life, sober, without toxic people in her life but with her two lovely cats to have fun and to put a smile on each and every one of our faces. And she succeeded at it. Jujube made this season fun, and I will forever be grateful that she was on our screens. Like I said in my Who Should Win Some Stars 5 video, Jujube's story on the show would have been one of the best ones, with, and again, her new lifestyle, her winning her first challenge, her losing the lip sync for the first time, and this being her third time in the finale of a season. Only if she had won the season. But she didn't. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Cracker. Hmm. You know those memes, TV show villain, real villain? Yeah, Alexis is the TV show villain. Cracker is the real villain of the season. It was somewhat refreshing to see her in the end triumph as the statistically best competitor, even though she was clearly playing a very strategic game. We haven't seen something like this since Alaska on All Stars 2. However, it wasn't really enjoyable. Whenever Cracker, and Shay, as I'll mention later, spoke, it always seemed like she was reading off a script that she created in her head, so nothing really seemed genuine and everything came off as rehearsed. And lastly, Shay Coulee. What a legend! I've already mentioned how a portion of her fandom are absolute crackheads that could ruin your experience in enjoying Shay's drag, but I also want to mention that they're not a reflection of her. Shay, intentionally or not, played the game of lowering her threat level while still showing how good of a queen she is, from the moment she stepped into the workroom. Sometimes that was enjoyable to watch, sometimes, like with Cracker, it seemed too forced. Basically, they are two sides of the same coin. Much like Jujubee, she did well in pretty much every single challenge that she was in, and the three aforementioned times when she was up for elimination could just be described as drama, nonsense, and situational. Speaking of drama, a lot of people in my comments were so annoyed by Shay's story over her loss in season 9, with her bringing up the fact that sometimes alleged fans of hers would come up to her with rose petals during meet and greets because I don't know. They weren't phased right, I guess, and some people felt like the show was pushing this trauma of hers too hard on us. Are these the same people that advocate for mental health on Twitter? Do these people not know that getting over something bad, disappointing, traumatic is not formulaic and can take months, years even to get over, and yet you can still never fully get over it? especially if you are reminded of it almost on a daily basis. It's very interesting that some queens' mental health is more relatable than others. Ms. Cracker's <clears throat> anxiety, or whatever, making her be a straight-up bully towards Angina is relatable to people, but Che Coulee still feeling the effects of a traumatic experience is annoying to you. Hmm, very interesting. Some people even pointed out that she was trying to shove the story down our throats, but if I remember correctly, this was only ever a plotline in two episodes, and the second time that it happened it was more advised by Ross Matthews for Shay to lean into the rose petals thing. Shay played the season in a very smart way, to the point where she got crowned in the same style of wig Sasha wore when she beat her, though in the color of the wig that she wore when she lost. I also want to point out something regarding the top three. During their speeches in the last episode where they have to say why they should win the season, 
you know, why they are the best drag queen on that stage for the spot in the Hall of Fame, the three speeches went as follows. Jujubee. I should win because of my heritage and being a good representation. Cracker. I should win because of my heritage and being a good representation. Shay. I should win because of my heritage and being a good representation. Also, Rue, you are a god who never does anything wrong. It's ridiculous at this point, and all I can do is laugh. To quote Aja, I'm about to straight shit on these bitches now, just letting you know. What the actual rats ass were the challenges this season? So, with the first challenge, they kept the variety aspect of it, because I guess they quickly, after all such, to realize that not many drag queens have talents in the classical sense of the word. But now, it was a work the world variety eleganza show, which, what? So, the focus is on the fact that it has to be entertaining just entertaining. No other adjective, but entertaining. Not moving, not groundbreaking, entertaining. And as I often do, I made a table. Honestly, no, 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 no. Please do not lie to yourself and say that what Mariah did was entertaining. Was it intriguing? Yes. Was what she said correct? Yes. Did it come at the right time? Yes. Was it an exhibition of a skill, or was it something that you could watch for five minutes in a lineup where there are also Naomi Smalls and Cameron Michaels tearing the house down every night with their performances? Nope, it was not. More to the point, why did some queens get dancers? Like, the focus should be on them. Why did they pitch correct some of Juju's singing in post? What was going on? The rest of the challenges were weird as well. You had a repeat of the club challenge from All Stars 4, but now it was hotel rooms. Because drag queens do that. They design and promote hotels. What? Snatch Game of Love as a format is faulty, because the queens are divided into two groups randomly, and with a different mixing of the groups, the winner of the week may not have been the same. There were also too many group challenges this season, and in the third and fourth episode, the producers put the girls into teams. It wasn't the girls picking who they wanted to work with, and so certain queens were hindered, whereas certain were kept safe. Furthermore, and I know someone will mention this in the comments, the favoritism of certain queens just because they had more wins than your fave. Now let me tell you, while watching the season with what we were presented, there were no hypocritical critiques from the judges, meaning that one queen would be praised for something while another would be criticized for it. However, this season, alongside All Stars 3, did not have a makeover challenge. Hmm... I wonder why that is. Let's look at the original placements that All Stars 5 queens had in similar challenges on their original season, and also the original placements on the makeover challenge. Hmm... Yeah, I'm not gonna say anything. I think you're smart enough to draw your own conclusion from what you can see here. The lip syncs are an integral part of Drag Race, and as that, usually provide some of the most iconic moments of the season. Usually. I'll keep it short here. Most lip sync assassins brought onto the season clearly could not give a crap about being there. I mean, am I supposed to believe that Alyssa Edwards would not turn it out in a lip sync? Or that Miss Cracker is the first person to beat Kennedy Davenport, THE Kennedy Davenport, in a lip sync? The song choices were, for the most part, choices, with the only standout being Lizzo's Juice. The final three lip sync song was Janelle Monae's Make Me Feel, which, after If I Were Your Woman, Wrecking Ball, and Fighter, just seems very minimalistic. Now don't get me wrong, I love that song. Dirty Computer is my second favorite album of 2018, but it's not a great final lip sync song. Eh. Like the majority of the season, eh. Alongside the lip syncs, the runway looks are also a staple of Drag Race. As a whole, I'd say that it was a success, and I'll just mention which looks this season I loved in chronological order. Jujubee's look in episode 1. While it was just a simple dress, it made Juju look elegant and fit the theme of the song she sang. 
Angina's entrance look, Jujubee's, Mariah's, and Shay's love the skin you're in looks, Alexis and Jujubee's prom queen fantasy looks, Alexis and Jujubee's backyard ball looks, Jujubee's freak out look, Shay's comedy challenge thing look, and last but not least, Jujubee's final three runway look. Please, I'm begging you not to comment anything stupid along the lines of you forgot X, Y, or Z. I did not forget. I just did not like those looks. Thank you. <music> Lastly, I want to talk about the editing and storytelling of this season. As per usual, it was a mess. For example, in the first episode, Jujubee and Eric were shown as mini-villains of the season, just because the episode had India winning it. But in the next episode, Jujubee's edit changes. As in, it doesn't really exist anymore, she's just Jujubee and it's refreshing to see. But by the setup of the first episode and the alarming amount of shocked and offended looks by the rest of the cast when she said that she had not voted for Derek in the second episode, made it seem like she was going to be the main villain of the season. Pair this up with the edit showing Alexis as aggressive and confrontational, which Mind you, she might be, but she isn't just that, and the editors decided to show us, again, just that. What a lot of the fans held against the show is that it felt anticlimactic and too short, and I understand the first sentiment. However, it probably only felt too short because there wasn't a returning Queens episode, which almost always puts the season on hold by an episode or two, and then it continues once the returning Queens are out. But in fact, this season was just as long as All Stars 2 and 3, shorter than All Stars 4, but longer than All Stars 1. It may have seemed longer, just because of the situation we are in now, where we spend most of our time, hopefully, at home, keeping ourselves and others safe, and just going through the motions, so the day seemingly blend together. Now, I know what some of you may say. How can you criticize the show for being overproduced, but also demand better production and storytelling? Well, my babe, I'm just going to direct you towards a show which Drag Race got its format for this season from. Survivor. And speaking of Survivor, stand the best winner of all time, King Yule. And that's it. That's the video. I would say that, as a whole, All Stars 5 was a solid 6 out of 10, with minimal rewatch value, which mostly falls down on Jujubee and some of the runway looks. Still, it didn't have nearly as much tomfoolery as the previous three seasons, so that's a bonus, I guess. Thank you for watching.